Hello and welcome to another episode of Trash to Track. In this episode we're going to be looking at the second of Mark's Locos, the first one being the Tender Drive Duchess we did a few episodes ago. In this episode we're going to be looking at a Hornby A1 Pacific, uh, namely Tornado. Unboxing uh, it from its package that came from Ireland, you can see that the tender is in quite good condition, it just needs a bit of a dust up and a wheel clean. However, the loco is a totally different story. And as you'll see, this loco certainly needs a lot of work. It's been disassembled and then taped back together, so we're going to have to uh, take this apart and then start from scratch. The smoke box door there is also loose. So getting the usual magnetic tray, I'm going to start by removing the... Uh, I don't quite know what those wires are for at the moment. I think they may be pickup. But I'm going to start by removing the black insulation tape that's holding this tornado together. Using the usual pair of needle nose pliers, I just unwrap the tape carefully, trying not to ruin any of the side rods. And then I discard this in the bin. I won't be using this again. It has left some residue on the body side there, which I'll remove later in the rebuild. This tape really was sticky stuff and I had a job removing it without damaging any of the handrails or side rods. The bottom just comes away then and it becomes clear that those wires go to these pickups which are rather badly bent so we're going to have to look at these later and that there is the base keeper plate. The wheels are loose although they won't be released as the side rods are held in place um, by the motor housing and the front bogey has been screwed into the actual body securing lug. So getting a small Phillips screwdriver I start by removing that front bogey and putting that in the tray with its screw. And then I remove the body mounting screw. Oh, the cylinders have fallen off there as well. And then I'm going to remove this front screw here to release the body from the chassis and see what we're actually working with. The body comes off in one piece and apart from missing the deflectors and the damage to the smoke box, it's not in too bad a condition. Now the wheels are loose as I said, so I'm going to have to disassemble this entire chassis to get the um, side rods and chassis frame out. I start by undoing the screw that holds the DCC interface in and then remove this screw here which removes the weight. Once this is lifted off it releases the side rods and coupling rod mechanism which can then be slid forward over the chassis frame, releasing the wheels as well. There's quite a bit of fluff and gunk and crud all over this model so I'm going to strip it down and give it a good clean. I'm going to mark the flywheel there so that you guys at home can see when it starts turning and we're going to do a battery test uh, once I put the blanking plate back in. I'm going to give it a battery test to see if the motor actually works. Now the motor did spin but it was a bit lumpy to say the least. The motor was running not smoothly at all. It was running so I wasn't overly concerned but you could feel like a thumping in the model when you held the chassis like this. This will come to raise its ugly head later on, but for now we'll start by stripping the model completely down. More by luck than judgement, Mark managed to keep and maintain all the screws on this model so I didn't have to buy a new screw pack for it. Although that motor mounting lug there has snapped off. To remove the motor you simply just remove the bracket on the back and then the whole thing just pulls out. There's the dual cog that um, transfers power from the worm drive to the uh, motor from the motor to the wheels rather. Now that the whole chassis frame is stripped down I'm going to start by cleaning it all off as there's quite a lot of dried up lubrication inside this. To do that I put it in this tub and then give it a good dousing with this WD-40 contact cleaner. This manages to clean all the um, crud out of the model and off the sides. It will need further cleaning later on with some cotton buds but this gets the majority of it off especially in the hard to reach places like inside there where there is a cog sandwiched in the actual die cast chassis which I didn't want to remove for fear of not being able to put it back in correctly. Using quite a bit of spray here I do give it a good clean over and then once I've finished spraying it I'm going to use my wife's toothbrush again although I think she's cottoned onto me now as this one seems to have been left in the garage and I'm going to use this toothbrush to uh, give it a good scrub and a clean up. Work methodically and go through everything as I want to remove all this dirt and get this running like new, ready for when it goes back to Ireland. 
Now I'm going to reassemble the chassis just initially without the wheels just to give the motor a test. So I put the cog back in and give it some a light lubrication as now that all the lubrication that was applied in the factory has been cleaned off. This will all need redoing but fresh lubrication is the way to go. You don't want to be using the old dried up lubrication that was in there. Using a cocktail stick I apply the usual silicon grease there and then refit the cog back ready to put the motor back in. I also put some silicon grease on the worm gear there in the motor and then thread the wires through the hole in the die cast chassis and then clip the motor mounting and housing all back in place. Now that's all back in place I'm going to give the motor another test with the battery and it, it runs but it's just not running to my satisfaction this really isn't very good. I'm not sure why and I haven't cottoned on to what it is yet but it's just not very good at all. I'm also going to refit this flangeless pony wheel that goes on the back here as this won't need to be removed again. Again as I always say when reassembling models do not over torque the screws as you can end up de-threading them or indeed if it's the wrong screw you'll end up threading the hole and then uh, the original screw won't go back in. The cylinder block there was okay it was just slightly dusty so now that the toothbrush is dried I'm going to give that a quick brush up to remove any fluff and dust that's on it. And then I'm going to refit the wheels and the side rods. The side rods simply clip into a hole in the die cast chassis there. That's the top mounting and the wheels sit in place like that. All the wheels have brass bearings and they need to go into their designated holes in the underside of the chassis. Now that the wheels are in place I'm going to remove them individually to clean up any fluff that is caught around the crank pins and also give the wheels and the axles a thorough cleaning. As you can see the wheels have some sort of dust all in in the spokes so this will all need to be removed. This is on all six of the wheels and using a dry stiff brush I simply just brush in the spokes until all the dust has been removed. Now that all the wheels have had the dust removed I'm going to clean the wheel backs first with a cotton bud and methylated spirits because the um, pickups all rub on the backs of the metal tyres here so they all need to be squeaky clean and then I'm going to give the actual wheel treads a good clean as I do the side rods as there's quite a bit of muck and grime built up on these. This is a long process and takes a while to do or clean all the pieces but it is essential for good running and reliable running. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the wheels a polish up with a fiberglass pencil as the cotton bud of mess didn't remove most of the built on crud. As you can see there the wheels are gradually getting their shine back so it's worth doing this. Be careful using a fiberglass pencil as you can end up with the small shards breaking off and sticking into your skin and that really isn't pleasant as it takes somebody with good eyesight and tweezers to pull them out. It's surprising how painful little tiny fibres off a fiberglass brush can be. Now that all um, three uh, axles and six wheels have been done I'm going to give the side rods here a look at and that connecting piston rod there you can see is bent right out of shape. So I'm going to straighten that by using my needle nose pliers and some other flat nose pliers just to bend it back into shape and try and straighten it up without removing the entirety of the um, side rods there. If this goes wrong or snaps I'm going to have to buy some spares for this model. But luckily enough, after some gentle persuasion, with two differing pairs of pliers, I managed to get it straight again. And I'm happy with how that's straightened out and it shouldn't prove any difficulty when being returned to running. When it was bent like it was before, it could have caught on the wheel or pulled the piston out of the cylinder, ruining the side rods completely. Now that the wheels have all been cleaned, I'm going to put the wheels back in the chassis and look at the pickup issue. The um, drive wheel there that sits in the middle has a big brass bearing on one side and a tiny thin one on the other, both of which need to be in line to slot into the chassis before the wheel goes into place, just like that. And then the cog engages with the worm gear from the motor. Now that all the wheels are back in place and I've managed to find my local loco cradle, I give the axles a slight oiling with some modelling oil and I also put a small amount of silicon grease on the cog there which uh, engages with the motor worm. As I've said before lubrication doesn't need to be overdone 
overdo it and you'll end up cleaning it off or it'll make your track dirty and oily. A small amount is all that's needed. I'm not too fussed about this amount of silicon grease on here as any excess will fall into the chassis keeper plate after it's all been reassembled. Now I'm going to address the pickups. Now these two wires have these um, connectors on the end which should slide onto this brass. However they're crimped and now they've been pulled out it's nigh on impossible to get the brass back into the crimps. So what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to strip the wires and actually solder them in place to prove a more reliable joint. First of all I'm going to re um, repair this broken spring piece here with some Loctite super glue as one of the springs on the chassis underframe there is broken but it hasn't been lost. So hopefully by applying a small amount of super glue and then holding it in place it won't fly off in the future and it's repaired it. The pickups there as you can see are really badly bent so I'm going to do my best now to try and straighten these out using my needle nose pliers. The brass that Hornby used for these pickups is extremely thin and delicate so don't overdo anything like this because if you snap one of them off you're going to end up with uneven pickup on the drive wheels and it just won't work properly. When I've straightened them out to an extent that I think will be um, acceptable I give the whole uh, pickup plate there a clean with the cotton bud and methylated spirits again. Now here I am trying to put these brass um, sleeves into these crimps but as you can see it's just impossible. The, the, they're so tiny and the brass is so flimsy you've just got no chance in ever getting those back in there. So what I'm going to do is as I said I'm going to strip the wires and I'm actually going to solder them in place. Just a tiny amount of solder on my iron and just tinning the end of the red wire there. I'm going to solder them onto the brass tabs and as I said before this will prove a uh, this will prove to be a more reliable method of pickups to the motor and guarantee power all the time. Whereas over time those crimped ends I believe could work loose or indeed come off completely as they had done on this model. Now that both wires are in place you can see there are these tiny little crimps um, well that's the solder joint and they're the tiny crimps that come off it. They're going straight in the bin. Now to give a quick battery test just to ensure that all is well and as you can see there the middle wheel once it's not um, impeded by the loco cradle that is the middle wheel spins quite nicely. Actually no it doesn't. <laughs> I am, eventually I managed to get it to go but it seems to be that the pickups are not working properly and by the look of that wheel the battery is almost flat so at this moment in time I believe it's a battery issue as it should spin quicker than that. Now that the pickups are all in line with the wheels I give the chassis keeper plate a quick going over with a cotton bud and this is handed as well it only goes on one way the brake shoes all line up with the wheels and then I reapply the screws that were in the base of the model when I got it. As I said before, this was really lucky that Mark managed not to lose any of these screws. And they was mostly, although not the front one, but they were mostly in the correct place, which helped enormously rebuilding this model. Now I'm going to reassemble the side rods there. First off is the long one that goes on, followed by the washer, then the piston rod, and then this linkage on here, which only goes on a certain way. And then again, using the hex nut screwdriver just tighten the nuts up and the same was repeated on the other side. These do need to be tight as tight as you can go with these because if not they can work loose when running. I've, be, I've done that before in the past where I've not tightened them up completely and they have come off and then you're searching around the layout for a tiny screw and a washer. You see it's not running very well here the, it's starting to go but I'm just not convinced with this motor there's just something about it and it made a really strange sound as well when it was going along. So I'm testing it here with the leads of an old controller that I've got connected to this test track. And it starts to run nice and I think I've turned a corner and I think oh it may be worth now um, reassembling the model completely. But I just had a gut feeling about this and I thought no I'm going to leave the body off for now and I'm going to give it a proper running in. It didn't smell too handy either at this point and I would was beginning to wonder what on earth was going on. So I've took the motor out again thinking that I may have reapplied, uh, reassembled it wrong and that it was it may have been a bit tight and I test it with the battery and as you can see there the motor spins freely and it's running quite nice and I thought well okay then maybe I'd put it up uh, maybe I'd tighten the screws up a bit too much maybe I'd nipped it up or it was catching on something. 
So then I put it back onto the test track and this, I thought um, I'll give it another go of testing it. But this is when things all started to go badly wrong. I took the banking plate off there in case it was shorting out onto the diecast chassis. But if you watch very closely now, you will see a whiff of white smoke come out of that motor. There we go in slow motion. You can see it out. And the motor then was dead and it stunk. So I took it apart to have a look and what it was, the motor had failed. If you look in the motor case in here, you can see these bits of solder that have managed to find their way into the coils of the motor and in the motor housing. Well, these were tiny bits of solder and I managed to pull them out with a cocktail stick and I thought, well, where on earth have these come from? They're all stuck to the magnet. And they've come from that plate there with the silver on. The solder has actually come undone from the coils. And this is why the motor wasn't running properly. It was running lumpy because the armature guard had come off. And as is becoming the norm with Hornby, finding spares for this model was nigh on impossible. These motors were out of stock everywhere. Hornby, if you are watching, stop using cheap motors in your good models, as it's not fair on the people that are running them. While I try and figure out what to do about the motor, I'm going to turn my attention to the tender and just give it a good dusting with a stiff brush. This is all that was required on the tender. Now, those white spots there did come off eventually, but the tender wheels were clean and this was just dusty. So I gave it a quick spruce up and then I did give the wheels a wipe with a cotton bud and methylated spirits for good measure. This tender doesn't provide any pickups or anything for this model, which is a shame. As if it did, if the DCC de uh, decoder socket and pickups were in the tender, it would run a lot better. Now I'm going to turn my attention to the actual loco body shell and give this a good dusting as well. As this was incredibly dusty and as you can see there, the smoke box door has actually just fallen off. So I'm going to have to reattach this. And it's also missing buffers from the front. So I'm going to go through my spares bin and see if I can find two that are compatible. I managed to find two um, small pin buffers that I'm going to put in the end there. And they seem to fit and be the right size. So these will be attached with some super glue. And then what I'm going to do with the buffer um, shanks that are broken, I'm going to build them up using model filler. As I did one of the trying 37, I did way back in episode 2 of Trash to Track. So as I said, I'm going to fit these two buffers onto the front there with some small amount of super glue. And now they're in place, they look quite nice. I'm, as, and now I'm going to get the model filler and I'm going to actually fill around the, um, the buffer houses. I also need some deflectors for this model. And I had it in my head that I'd got a pair of deflectors from Tornado in my spares. Although I'm not entirely sure where they come from. I mean, there's one there from a Britannia, a trying Britannia. And I also find it's matching pair in here as well. And there, lo and behold, there is a Tornado deflector, which is from a Hornby model. So this should be a straight replacement fit. I also find a German style smoke deflector. I was tempted to put that on just to have a look what it would look like, as obviously that's what the Flying Scotsman runs with. So with um, the deflectors and the smoke box door i'm going to use very small amounts of plastic weld cement to put this back in place the smoke box door itself there is, has got a crack going through it so holding it in place with a my thumb and forefinger i just use a small amount of plastic weld on the inside that seeps into the crack and holds it firmly before reapplying it to the front of the model here i'm using the filler to uh, build up those buffer houses as i said and this was a slow process, working steadily with a flat bladed screwdriver, as I found that was easier than a bit of plastic card as it had a longer handle on it to work in this small area. And just work it around so that you've got a smooth buffer shank there and any lines in it follow the lines on the Hornby moulding. Once that was done, I reapplied the smoke box door, if I'm not going to drop it that is, using again small amounts of plastic weld cement. You really don't need a lot of this stuff. I mean, it looks like it evaporates quickly, but it is still there and tacky. And this will form almost a plastic welded bond between the two parts. However, do not get it on any painted finishes as it will take paint off like paint stripper and then you're back to square one. And I really didn't fancy a complete respray with this model. Pop in the smoke box door in and then Tornado has its face again. Although, as you can see there, there is some damage on that from, I think, where it's been dropped on the floor. 
There's also a hole in the side of the smoke box there, a piece of plastic that had broken off, obviously when the deflectors came off. So this again was filled with model filler using the screwdriver technique, and then when that was dry, it was smoothed with some 1200 grit wet and dry paper. Now the motor conundrum, I actually got another spare one. But to obtain a spare motor, I had to resort to the ridiculous thing of buying an entirely uh, new chassis off an old railroad flying Scotsman. We as modellers shouldn't be in that position. Hornby should be providing spares for their models, especially when the motors are as cheaply made as this one is. But it is a like-for-like -like replacement, so I'll crack ahead anyway and put the pickup wires in between um, the two pieces of die cast there, which has got a hole in it. And here is the donor chassis that off the flying scotsman and it just shows that even though the die cast is the same it's actually shorter as the other parts on it are only made for flying scotsman now i'm soldering the wires back onto the capacitor which i left on as uh, mark has this on dc and not dcc so when once i've soldered the wires on i'm going to give this a battery test on the test track to see if we've finally cured the problem of the bad motor Well, it would work, but as you can see, the obvious obvious mistake there. No, no life. Anybody guess? I didn't put the blanking plate in. <laughs> what an idiot. Right, we'll put the blanking plate in, making sure it's the right way around, and lining up the number one with the one on the actual uh, PCB there. And now we'll go again. Oh, it's not ready yet. Oh, dear. The pickups are obviously not working very well and I'm now starting to get extremely frustrated with this model. So off the bottom comes again and I'm going to clean up any of the leftover solder flux and leftover gunk on these pickups and I try and bend them out back into shape again and hopefully next time we test it we will, um, we will have a running loco. I'm just checking everything's in line there because I don't understand now why this tornado won't work. It's showing up as a short circuit, but everything seems to be in order. I was concerned at the moment about the, that rear wheel touching the die-cast chassis, but then, whoa, the battery test after adjusting the pickups and everything runs correctly. But not off that back wheel. Those pickups really did not like the, the power. So again, I adjusted them with the tweezer nose pliers and now we'll try it again. So all pickups have now been adjusted for the third time. And I'm going to give this a shot at running. And what do you know, it shoots off lovely. It's running smooth, the motor doesn't smell and is not emitting white smoke. And now we can finally, hopefully, see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm now going to start reassembling the model. By removing the screw there, which I had kept in the chassis plate so I didn't lose it and I knew which one it was, I'm going to reattach the front bogey. The front bogey was cleaned up, the wheels were cleaned and the axle was lubricated as per normal, just so that it's um, smooth running for when it goes back to Ireland. Once it's all back in place, one final test with the battery to make sure I've not nipped any wires or I've created any more short circuits. And it's running nicely, so I'm going to go now and turn my attention back to the Loco body shell. As I said earlier, 1200 grit wet and dry just to smooth that uh, filler down and uh, con contour it to the smoke box uh, shape. And then I'm going to give it a coat of rail match satin black paint. And I, I, to match it in, I actually end up um, repainting the entirety of the smoke box. I use a very thin brush for this, and it is a wedge shape brush so you can use it either for fine detailing work or indeed like this just to touch in the black paint some people might ask why i didn't mask it all up and then spray the front black with an airbrush or aerosol and i just didn't want to do that i didn't want to go to the effort of masking everything up just to spray some black and at the end result as you'll see shortly by brush painting it it really didn't make a lot of difference while the paintbrush was out, I also touched up the filler on the buffer shanks with that rail match red. And then we left it all to dry before I applied the smoke deflectors. The smoke deflectors were replaced onto the model in their um, corresponding slots in the chassis there with these tabs. And they were um, secured in place initially with the satin varnish method. 
And then once that was dry, I did run a small bead of plastic weld cement underneath just to hold them in place firmly. I didn't want to get any of the plastic weld cement on the top of the model for fear that it might remove the painted finish, as I mentioned earlier on. These deflectors from Hornby come with a pre-printed Tornado nameplate, which you can easily cover with an etched product should you desire to. And the same was repeated on the other side for the other deflector. I used a small piece of masking tape just to hold them in position while the satin varnish dried, and I run a small bead on the outside there, but don't worry, it might look white in the picture, but once dry, you cannot um, tell the difference between that and the satin finish that Hornby um, provide. Removing any excess with a damp cotton bud. And there we go, Tornado is starting to look like a proper loco again. A far cry from the uh, wreck of a model that arrived with me in the post from Ireland. I'm just giving the body another once over before finally reassembling it to the loco chassis. To reassemble Tornado onto its chassis, you have to engage the clip at the back that is there underneath the cab in the corresponding clip on the chassis and then the whole thing gently pushes down and then the front securing lug clips into place like that. I put it in the loco cradle upside down and then reattach the screw. Again, I know I've said it and I will keep saying it, do not over tighten your screws on these models as you really don't want to damage them at this late state in the at this late stage in the game. I found using a pair of tweezer nose pliers for this very handy as the uh, magnetism has gone out of my screwdriver. Now that the body's on, another quick test just to make sure that I haven't trapped any wires and that everything was running okay. And at this point it would be, let's have a look at what we started with and I'd go to the turntable scene. However, when I had uh, filmed the turntable scene, I put Tornado on my layout for a run round and it just kept stopping in random places. And as you see here on the viaduct and on the sea wall. It was a particularly slow runner and as I said, on straight track it just kept stopping. It even stalled on express points that are electro frog. Upon investigation, the pickups were just not, just not in keeping. So I actually replaced the entire pickup plate with the one off the chassis donor from the Flying Scotsman. So this is what we started with. This tornado arrived from, here, from Ireland in a very poor condition. It was held together with insulation tape. The side rods were all mangled. There were, indeed one was bent. The wheels were there loose. The front pony truck had been screwed in the wrong place. The deflectors were missing and it was just a real basket case. The, the buffers were also missing on the front. The tender, however, was immaculate and required no effort, which didn't really help. But we did it. I set it aside, worked methodically on it for a few days. And uh, after about a week, and that included trying to get the new motor for it, this is what she looks like now. Back to the glory days of Tornado. I really can't believe the transformation of this model. It is stunning now. Showroom condition almost. Although you will notice the eagle-eyed there. That I am missing a glazing unit at the left hand side of the cab. This is because despite various searches I just couldn't find one that fit. I even tried a Backman one and it just wouldn't fit so I've left it out now and plus that would have been an additional cost um, in the restoration of this model. I'm going to leave you now with some shots of Tornado finally running around the layer on a rake of Vans and a rake of Mark 1s and I hope you'll agree that this has been a rather good if not problematic rebuild from rubbishy condition to quite nice. Here is Tornado now, running around the layout on a few Mark 1s, a mixture of mainline and some hatchet parkwork coaches that I have in stock. If you've got an engine you'd like to see featured in a future episode of Trash to Track, please email me at dansmodelrailways at gmail.com and we can arrange getting it sent over for a rebuild. As you'll see from this episode, nothing really will put me off anything you've got even if it's mangled to hell send it over and we'll give a give it a bloody good shot at getting it running again as we have done with this tornado thanks for watching trash to track stay tuned for a little cameo at the end of the video which i thought was quite funny utilizing the harbor on my layout but until then i'll leave you with some shots of it running around the layout as it should be before shipping it back to ireland thanks again for watching please like share and subscribe if you haven't already and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.
now that Tornado has been running, we see her on the dockside here at Abbots Newton waiting to be loaded onto that rusty old cargo ship there when it's bound for Ireland. The cargo ship itself is a commission build which on itself is on its way to Spain. So they will both be departing to Pastors New soon. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch you again in the next one.